In this lesson's episode, explore how a journey from food science to longevity research reveals unexpected connections between what we eat and how we age. Learn how scientific tools used in food labs can apply to genetics and space research. Discover the truth behind food myths and the role moderation plays in health and understand how bacteria, biofilms, and even bean sprouts are influencing the future of DNA protection and human longevity. You have a very interesting life. I'm just going to say that because we're going to go through it. And your life is actually very interesting, all the different things that you've done. But at this point, um, what, what is your, what is your, what is your uh, passion? What kind of science do you care about? After a four-year undergrad in food science, you do your master's in food science. Food science. So now you love... PhD in food science. So it, uh, it makes a lot of sense that you're probably going to figure out how to have a career in food science. Um, when you go through everything, you have your PhD and then you're going to your postdoc and also food science? Uh, no, uh, longevity. Gen longevity? Department of Genetics. What does that mean? Like what kind of job is food science? What are you, what are you solving for humanity with food science? So every single thing people drink from that water or any food they touch, a food scientist has yeah. worked on it. And food science, in my opinion, is one of the most applied sciences you can go for because your, your goal is is to make something that everyone will eat or touch. So you could be in food micro, food safety, product design, so developing you know, cookies or chips yeah. or the next snack bar or healthy foods, or you can be food engineering, so actually working on the machines that make the food processing in the food processing plants. It's phenomenal. Um, I think you know, based on my experience and what I know being on the board of a department, a few other things, it's one of the most underappreciated jobs with one of the highest job placement rates in general because everyone needs to eat. We have finite land. The population keeps growing. So somehow we have to provide food for all the people while we're losing resources. And food science is an interesting uh, thing. So originally I was going to be a professor. So I started teaching at Boston University when I was 23. That's young, no? Yeah, it's pretty young. Yeah. Uh, so I was teaching classes in the graduate and undergraduate for uh, in the Department of Health Sciences at Boston University. And my goal was, after I graduate my PhD, go there full time and, and teach there. But the opportunity at Harvard came up. And what made you switch from food sciences to longevity? Uh, that was an opportunity. So I was doing my PhD and I remember I got a phone call. Boston area coach I thought was BU. I pick it up. And it's this guy, David Sinclair from Harvard Medical School. He's a big deal. I had no idea who he was. And he's like, hey, Kyle, I read some of your papers. You're the only person in the world doing this type of work. How about you come to my lab and work on this when you're done with your PhD? And what he was asking me to do was in the wheelhouse of what I did. So like, let me step back. Like, you know how math is like a universal language? Yeah. Science is the same thing. Like, even though I'm in food science, all the techniques that I learned and used can be applied to all other sciences, whether it's running protein gels or sequencing or doing enzyme assays. Yeah, I applied it for like, in my case, bean sprouts, but all those techniques I could use in the area of genetics and longevity. So even though it seems like a big stretch scientifically, my the toolbox I had fit like a glove. So I decided to go there. Was there ever a point uh, in your career when you went back and used some of the food science? Oh, all the time. All the time. So uh, believe it or not, cosmetics are very similar to food. A lot of the ingredients in cosmetics are food ingredients. Yeah. So you're making emulsions or delivery systems yeah. or stability, uh, even the, um, the cadence of creating things and the business sense for margins and production scale timelines kind of mirror that of the food industry. So I use it all the time, believe it or not. What we're spending so much time uh, studying food and food science, what are some, I would say, scary, unnerving things about the food that we eat that people don't quite know? There's a few things. Um, I'm in the, the mindset of moderation is key. So yeah, there's some negative attributes to foods, maybe some of the preservatives or the colorants, but um, everything in moderation you know, should balance out fine. It's even like if you eat McDonald's, like fast food, like eating it now and then isn't going to destroy you. Um, but having a moderation mindset is is good. My biggest thing, pet peeve, is like kind of the marketing side where people will market things as like the 
the, the cure for something or help alleviate something. And the science is there, but it's not science that's actually been proven out as rigorously as some people think. Well, I see. So where I'm going with this is uh, people speak a lot about seed oils. Oh, yeah. that's People speak a lot about why they feel every time they go to Europe, they lose weight and they feel healthier versus when they're in the U.S., uh, obviously pesticides. And plus, like every second fitness guru on Instagram has their own view about food and what you should eat in this diet and that diet. Uh, but not many people are scientific. Yeah. And I'm curious what actually holds weight or what actually is true outside of just some, you know, Instagram influencer spouting off the latest trend. So like seed oils and other things that are pro uh, inflammatory, things that drive inflammation. Uh, you know, inflammation is bad. Uh, inflammation causes a lot of problems. But there are a lot of other things that are inflammatory as well. Like my favorite is like, you know, I don't want to eat, you know, seed oil or something, but I'll go drink alcohol every night. <laughs> and you know what I mean? It's like you have to in in the it has to be a whole lifestyle change, right? And even some diets like paleo diets or or some of these other things, they're not necessarily sustainable for a long period of time. They're good to cut weight or they're good to like, you know, get you feel good for a little bit, but you can't live on those your whole life. It's difficult. So like I always say like moderation and try to stick within the 2000 calorie, 2500 calorie, because that alone, that with sleep and good hydration will make you feel amazing. Because a lot of people don't realize how many calories they're actually taking in. And if you try to stick with the 2000 calorie or 2500 calorie, whatever you want to do, you'd be like, wow, I actually like can't eat the snacks or the chips or the things I go to all the time. But there is one, you know, things to say to whole, whole foods or minimally processed foods where you get a lot of fiber, a lot of nutrients, right? Nothing will replace those. Um, it's just our biology and how fast things absorb, how you feel after glycemic index, things like that, um, that impact your feelings. Is part of the work that food scientists do, and, and I guess this, um, I, I, it's not like a conspiracy, but it sounds like something that is a little bit nefarious, like including ingredients in foods that make them addictive. Is that? So I guess I, I'm going to say no, like it's not intentional, but food is designed for what? To sell, yeah. right? Like if you're a food company and your goal is to sell, you want to make foods that people want. And people want certain foods because we're biologically designed to want high calorie foods because back when we were in the caves, we didn't know when we would eat. Yeah. So we, we have that craving for high calorie foods, um, like high fats, stuff like that, because we want to pack on as much as we can. But now with our sedentary lifestyle, you know, all these different things is kind of counteracting are so now we're still craving the same foods, but we don't move. And everything's accessible, right? I can go down to the store and buy a bag of chips for 99 cents. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. You know, so it's a different, you have to look at all facets. You were working with bean sprouts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so bean sprouts, uh, I think they've sort of carried through all of your work because what I'm looking at here, they impacted your work with David uh, St. Clair. They also impact... Um, some of the things that you did in space with NASA. Um, a whole so, bunch of so things. So talk to me about bean sprouts. And this is work that you were doing when you were still uh, in school. Yeah. So I, my PhD was all about bean sprouts of all things. <laughs> but bean sprouts are incredibly dirty. And I say dirty as they have a lot of bacteria, a lot of bacteria on bean sprouts, and they're minimally processed, which means, you know, if you have some foodborne pathogens on there, and you eat them raw, you get sick. So one of the things around bean sprouts is bacterial biofilms. And these are basically um, structures that bacteria build. It's like on your teeth. You know, like if you don't brush your teeth and you scrape it, like the yeah. stuff comes. That's a bacterial biofilm. It's the same thing happens on produce, on bean sprouts. Same thing happened in the, happens on the International Space Station, the water systems. Same thing happens with some of the stuff we're working with, with, with David with. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to stop them. And so I developed a novel uh, disinfectant. It's, this is patented, where I would make spontaneous nano emulsions of carvacrol oil. It's like essential oil. 
and it would basically disinfect bean sprouts and seeds and make them safer. We actually went and pitched this to commercialize it, but uh, the manufacturing process and the overall like uh, cost per unit was just a little too high for farmers to really adopt because the margins on bean sprouts are like razor thin. Like you're not making a lot. So adding, you know, an extra 10 cents per production, it kills the it profitability. Kills it. Yeah. So, but the technology was sounding great. It just was an example of something that wasn't commercially viable because the economics didn't plan out. So how do you take that into longevity research? So one of the, <laughs> so there's another technology I was working on, which a bunch of these enzymes and these enzymes uh, break broke down components of bacterial biofilms. And there was one specific part that broke down DNA. And believe it or not, bacterial biofilms are held together by extraneous DNA. So DNA that bacteria release and it acts like a glue. So longevity-wise, um, the organisms that this came from are called extremophiles. So these are organisms that live in extreme environments. And this one organism was able to grow at 55 degrees centigrade. That's like 135, 137 degrees Fahrenheit. And why David was interested uh, was how can this organism survive for a long time without taking on a bunch of mutations and mutating and dying, right? So we were looking at like DNA repair mechanisms and the enzymes associated with it because with longevity... Damage to your DNA accelerates the aging process. And this is something called epigenetic drift, where over time, all the environmental stuff we get exposed to, whether it's food, pollution, sunlight, makes these damages over time where eventually we were not what we used to be and this leads to cancer. So we were trying to figure out how we can hijack these extremophiles and use them to protect ourselves and understand aging. And that led to another patent that ended up bringing us into the biodefense space, which is a whole other area <laughs> of things. Was there, was there anything that you discovered that is currently used commercially? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the enzymes uh, are used in uh, some of our commercial products, like face cleansers, toner, stuff like that. Now the commercial. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And then um, the stuff from space is using sunscreen and stuff like that. But the delivery system, that hasn't been licensed or incorporated, but the technology, the fundamentals around the technology are being incorporated in other areas. Well, I meant like in terms of DNA protection. Yeah, so <laughs> so uh, not commercially used, but in a lot of research for whether it's astronauts' health on the way to Mars. Uh, and that's how that that, that's you. one of the things. Okay. That's one of the things. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it's not on the market, but it's the foundation for a lot of research now that's moving forward in the space. When you when you when you patent these like very novel technologies, or is that the right word? Technology? Yeah, technologies. Sure. Um, the what's the path from when you start working on it mm -hmm. until somebody can go buy it and then use it for themselves for whatever longevity practice. So it depends on the type of product, right? So for example, uh, with the space ingredient, which we can, we'll cover, uh, we proved it in lab, we did all the clinical testing, we submitted it for a patent, but then we have to go from a test tube to scale, right? Like yeah. doing something in the lab is great, but if you can't scale it to the masses, it's useless. So then you have to scale that. And then once that's scaled, then you got to put it in products and then you got to scale the products. You got to mm -hmm. test it, then it goes to market. So for like the ingredients for a lot of the products we have, maybe three, four years, um, maybe five years, depending on how complex it is. The the space ingredient that was when you say space ingredient, just to clarify, that's also the DNA protecting ingredient. That one, that's sun protection and sun protection and DNA protection, DNA activation. That's one of them. Yeah, yeah that's true. one of them. Yeah, it's like five years. Give or take. Thanks for tuning in. If you found this valuable, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you want to dive deeper into this conversation, check out the links in the description to watch the full episode. See you in the next one.